And on with the business of the day. Let's see if we can get as much publicity as we got last week on CNN. <laughs> For those of you who were here, I guess we got a little play nationally and internationally. Um, our first three panelists were startup clients of Tech Columbus. Our first panelist, and I'll ask them to come up to the stage as I introduce them, is Raymond Bohawk, chairman and CIO of Call, uh, call Copy, a leading provider of innovative call recording and contact center solutions. Welcome, Ray. Next, Derek Brown, uh, founder and CEO of Accepted, which is a web-based pre-screening tool designed to streamline the admission process for fine arts colleges and programs. Derek. Next panelist is David Rinalo, uh, founder and CEO of Azati, a company that uses internet technology to connect local food producers directly with businesses, suppliers, and individuals interested in supporting local agriculture. We're all in favor of local sourcing. Uh, please welcome David. And finally, Chris Winslow, Assistant VP of Venture Acceleration for Tech Columbus. He has previously held the positions at, at, at positions at CompuServe, Meditech, Pinnacle Data Systems, and several startup businesses. Lastly, I want to introduce uh, Tim Haynes, our moderator this afternoon, formerly VP of Member Services and Marketing. Tim assumed the role of interim CEO for Tech Columbus on January 1, following the retirement of Ted Ford. Uh, let's welcome Tim and all the parties. <laughs> See if you can top Gordon. <laughs> Oh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. I think this is the third year, uh, if memory serves, I get that right, the third year that we've had a uh, Tech Columbus or tech, tech Community kind of event like this. We really love to showcase some of the very innovative young companies that are here in the region. We've had minimally invasive devices. You may remember Tracer Diagnostics or Manta. Uh, this year, we're fortunate to have uh, two real up-and-comers, as well as one that's uh, seen quite a bit of growth, and so you'll hear from them about their experiences. This is uh, an important time for us, for us regionally, across Ohio, across the nation and the world. Uh, the economy has struggled. It's not at the pace that we'd like it to be, and of course, uh, unemployment con continues to be a challenge. I don't know whether any of you saw the uh, business section of the dispatch this morning. Uh, they reported on a National Science Board study that said the U.S. had dropped in high-tech manufacturing employment by 25 percent over the last 10 years. In Ohio, it had dropped 29 percent. And uh, of course, those that were picking up during that time period were China, India, and some of the other developing economies across the world. Of course, the world is becoming a more and more competitive place. And we really shouldn't be surprised that other economies around the world are having the success that they're having. They're hungry. They're hungry. And they want opportunity. And they're willing to work extra hard. And they're willing to take risk. So it's an important message for us. What can we do? You know, we, we have to ask, ask ourselves, have we become too comfortable? Do we have that too much to lose mentality? So what do we need to do? We need to stay hungry. We need to continue to work extra hard. And we need to be willing to make bets and to take risks. And so what you'll be hearing today are some of the companies that are not afraid to jump in and take a risk. They're very, very focused on innovation. They're very focused on delivering new value to their customers. And we at Tech Columbus are working as hard as we can at uncovering, encouraging, catalyzing, and celebrating these kinds of companies. This is our future, and we need to embrace it. The good news is that we're making progress, and we're making progress right here in central Ohio. And uh, organizations like Columbus 2020 that's here today, and Tech Columbus and others are working hard to get the good work done. So that's really the intro here. I mean, it, it, it is a great story. You're going to hear 
from some really exciting companies. And uh, to introduce them, I'd like to introduce Chris Winslow, who, you've, who has been introduced already. Chris, by the way, has a tremendous background in industry. He's also started up a number of businesses of his own. He joined Tech Columbus a little less than a year ago, and uh, he's doing a super job for us. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. Um, as Tim mentioned, you know, a big part of our charter and our goal is to really create an e entrepreneurial ecosystem. And these three companies here each represent um, the type of organization that we're trying to help foster and grow in Central Ohio. Our charter is really to, to cry, try and create a streamlined acceleration path for innovative entrepreneurs to get their business launched and started. To Tim's point, what you see today in terms of new college graduates coming out of universities, for people making career transitions, highly unlikely that their next job is gonna be in a Fortune 500 company. Much more likely it's gonna be that they're gonna start a business of their own or they're gonna join up with a team, smaller team of people to create a business. Each of these three individuals have taken that plunge and have started really exciting businesses. We chose three, these three among a large group of companies that we work with because they're bold thinkers. They're risk takers, as Tim mentioned, and they also have the opportunity to create businesses that can be global and can really change the industries in which they participate. Lastly, each of them have taken advantage of the resources that are available here in Central Ohio to help start entrepreneurs. So as a way of kicking this thing off, I'd like for each of them to give a very brief overview of their business and its model. And I'll start with Dave from Azoti. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Ranallo. I'm the founder and CEO of Azoti. That's A-Z-O-T-I. Azoti means nitrogen in Italian. Uh, nitrogen's the key element in photosynthesis. It's why plants are green, and it's an enabler of growth. Uh, the goal of Azoti is to create a more efficient way for individuals and businesses to buy locally grown food. All right, so we're gonna do that by creating an online marketplace that brings buyers and sellers together, or buyers and producers together, and then we're gonna have a productivity engine that automates all of the interactions between these groups. Right. So, uh, I think it's important to understand a, a couple things about Azoti. Uh, one is on the, this is a consumer-driven uh, awareness revolution that's going on in the ag and food space. So whether you are um, interested in buying locally grown food because it tastes better, it's more nutrient dense, it's safer, um, you wanna support the local economy, and, and those are all great reasons to do it, but there's, there's, there's also a, a movement uh, around larger organizations getting involved in this. So this is not some hippie, hippie dippy West Coast, Cal Berkeley thing going on here. This is becoming a mainstream. So what, what we're finding, and this is, you could go and check the Wall Street Journal, and there's a number of sources for this, but Walmart, Safeway, Albertsons, Kroger, the state of Vermont have all pledged to double their purchases of locally grown food within the next two to three years. So Zodi is positioning itself to bridge the gap between the buyers, which are individuals and businesses, with the producers. And when we say uh, local food producer, we're talking about uh, mid and small, anybody who's not subsidized by the government. That's a good way to look at it. So small and mid-sized growers, as well as local food distributors like San Filippo Produce, Roth Produce, and generally these people are making anywhere from $20,000 a year all the way up to $30 million uh, a year in revenue. And so we're going to just make an efficient way for, to connect these folks. Uh, we launched in June, let's give a quick status. We launched in June, uh, we're launching our we started a company in June. We're launching our product in February. Within that short amount of time, we've been able to gather the top food growers in Central Ohio to join our platform. Uh, and we've also received uh, investment from the SBA loan without having to give up our homes as collateral. That's a big move. Uh, we got a 1492 uh, accelerator finalist that and gave us some cash. And then Dwight Smith uh, from Sophisticated Systems. Uh, was also one of our first investors, and he's one of the top tech angel investors in Ohio. 
And now we just found out that we're going to be qualifying for the pre-seed fund, which will pretty much allow us to prove this model and then go to the next round where we're going to be seeking between one and two million dollars. Thanks a lot. I'd ask Derek now to describe uh, Accepted. Uh, my name is Derek Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of Accepted, and that's A-C-C-E-P-T-D. <laughs> and yes, I know it's misspelled. Um, <laughs> we meant to do that. Um, <laughs> ironically enough, we work in higher education too, so. <laughs> Um, we are changing the way students apply to college for the better, um, starting with performing arts programs, so music, dance, theater programs, and then expanding into other areas of higher education. We plan international admissions, MBA programs. Um, so if you were a performing arts high school student before accepted and wanted to attend college um, to continue your study, it meant that you had to go across the country uh, one by one and do live auditions for each school that you're interested in. Um, and this was costing students and their parents hundreds and even thousands of dollars and wasted time um, traveling one by one, um, the airfare, travel costs, gasoline. So we looked at that and said, well, that's funny. There's got to be a better way to do that. And also from the university's perspective, they were watching hundreds and even thousands of live auditions each year of students. And they were just completely overwhelmed. Um, so we looked at that and said, technology can improve that process. Um, so what we did is, by launching Accepted, we created a platform that allows um, per prospective students to upload uh, videos of their performances. Uh, also pictures of their headshots, their resumes, contact information, all in one place, one easy place where they can then send that to schools electronically. So instead of having to travel around the country to attend live auditions, you would just submit your videos electronically and to the universities and get screened first and then narrow that down to a couple that you may want to go visit uh, once you make your final selection. And then from the university's perspective, we've given them a portal to manage all these applicants and videos in one place so they can rate them, view their videos, comment with fellow decision makers. So it really streamlines the, the decision making process for them as well. Um, so ultimately, we want students to have a better opportunity of getting into the school of their choice and also give university programs more qualified applicants and also expand their geographic reach. Chris mentioned um, thinking globally for this. We've already had international applicants from China, Taiwan, Puerto Rico using our system um, just because it eliminates that barrier for travel. Thanks, Eric. And last but not least, that's Ray to talk a little bit about Call Copy, a company he founded several years ago. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, Ray Bohack, uh, co founder, chairman, and CIO of Call Copy. Uh, we are in the uh, software company in the call recording and quality monitoring space for call centers. So uh, if you dial any under number and you hear this call may be monitored or recorded, it kind of starts there. Uh, we do a lot with that. So yes, people are listening to those and no, it might not be a human. Uh, we write software that automatically analyzes that, gives root cause analysis, and tries to ultimately solve problems that you've probably had. Um, you know, a lot of you have probably called in and, and entered your credit card number just for it to be asked again when you finally speak to somebody. Uh, or you've been transferred a number of times when you really should have been routed to the right person the first time that was you know, accountable and, and empowered to actually help you, right? Uh, those are the types of things that we're doing for companies. Um, we are installed uh, globally, um, a quick status update in the company, we're at about a $20 million run rate, uh, we'll uh, achieve just over 100, uh, well, cross the 100 mark in terms of employees this year, uh, Inc. 500, uh, been in the uh, top 10 for fast uh, 50 in the last three years and also uh, best places to work uh, for the same time period. Um, locally, some customers are NetJet, OCLC, IGS, Grange, uh, Nationwide. Nationally, OnStar, uh, Fidelity, Quicken Loans, U-Haul. Uh, so, um, you know, most most likely at this point, um, you've, you've probably encountered our software at some point. So, uh, real real fun thing that we do. You know, the the, the value play to our employees is, um, you know, we're we're the type of work environment where every employee is empowered to make change. You know, they see the results uh, and impact of of their idea is actually making it to the customer, and that's why people really like working for us and. Um, you know, that's a kind of a theme and a mantra that we want to keep as we continue to grow. Um, we uh, started uh, in 04 and moved into the uh, what was called the BTC, which is now Tech Columbus in 2005. 
uh, incubated there for a couple of years uh, while bootstrapping the company. Uh, took on a small angel, uh, lo uh, I guess, loan line of credit uh, through a, a friend of the, the business and uh, really grew up from there. Uh, recently closed our, our uh, first actual institutional round of funding. I did a Series A uh, at six and a half million dollars with Edison Ventures out of New Jersey. So um, we wanted to step on the gas pedal a little bit more and, and uh, see where this can go. Great, so, so, so three companies at different stages in their, uh, in their growth, in their development. Uh, and of course Ray has, in, in a very short amount of time, six or seven years, grown his business into a very, very meaningful business. So my first question is, uh, could you guys, and, and Chris, you can help me direct this, could you guys speak about the greatest challenges that you've faced as an entrepreneur? As Tim mentioned, you know, these companies are all what you consider to be small companies in the grand scheme of things, but in the startup world, they're very different stages of the startup world, um, where you know, as mentioned, Dave just came out of our 1492 accelerator program that we ran and really is just in the phase of launching his business. Derek has just gone from you know, launching and coming out of the OSU 10X program, getting follow-on funding and a joint, um, joint round between Tech Columbus and some other venture capitalists to get those guys launched, and obviously Ray is beyond that. So they all face different challenges. So I'd ask Derek maybe for you to start talk a little bit about, you've been in business now for just about a year, yeah. what were the challenges in getting started and, and what did you have to overcome to get to where you are today? You sure we got time for that question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest challenges that my co-founder Don Hunter and I faced is, you know, we're young, just a couple years out of college, so we'd, we'd never been there and done that before, so there was, a, there was and is a lot of mistakes to be made. So I think um, just getting started, we bootstrapped the thing, um, which meant we drained our savings, and uh, we thought we had a good concept that we believed in. We went out and started talking to potential customers and saw all these different opportunities. So one of the biggest challenges was taking those opportunities and narrowing it down into a path that we could focus on. And fortunately, um, within very early on, probably within a month of our concept, we got engaged with Tech Columbus and just started bouncing these tough questions off of them and uh, said, you know, who's our customer? We, wanted to, we thought we wanted to pursue athletics and um, general admissions and performing arts. We were all over the place. Mm -hmm. So um, just narrowing down and focusing on something that we can execute on, but keeping in mind that larger vision was one of the, one of the bigger challenges that we had. That's good. Dave, I'll ask you the same question. What were the challenges you had to overcome to get where you are today? Sure, I would say um, <clears throat> I'm 36 years old and I've been building uh, this solution, this marketplace and productivity engine for 15 years. Um, for, I was on Ford's first uh, direct-to-consumer website. I even helped Daniel Sad over here at Salon Lofts uh, build their marketplace and productivity engine for stylists, for doctors. And so uh, building the product and, and getting the resources to build a product, that, that, that wasn't our greatest challenge. Our greatest challenge is doing it correctly. So when I say that, I mean in, in Silicon Valley or places where just there's a ton of cash and people who understand what the startup, what a startup means, um, they have uh, less risk aversion than say people in the Midwest. So they will put cash in knowing that they're probably not gonna see it again, but it gives us enough time to make mistakes, right? We need to make as, we need to fail as quickly as possible to find, to iterate to the right answer. And when you're trying to do that in a bootstrap fashion or without the, the level of cash you need to build a product, get to customers, and then keep iterating and evolving the product so that it meets the needs of the customers, it takes some time. And when you're bootstrapping, it's brutal. So for instance, I had to get the SBA loan, which was for $36,000, and then work a consulting side, a gig on the side, and then go out and try to get people to believe in this idea from employees, round up investors who understood the space, and then get growers to actually give me requirements so I could build a product. That would have been 20 times easier if I could have just gotten 100 grand right out of the gate from somebody and just said, go fail quickly. All right, this is a lean startup methodology and Chris and Tech Columbus talk about this a lot. So that was, our, that was my greatest challenge. Yeah, that's great. Ray, I'll shift the question a little bit to you because you're a little bit further along and you've crossed 
what they call the valley of death in startup businesses, <laughs> where you get the early, and these guys are about to find out what the valley of death is here. Yeah. Sure. I think I know. <laughs> um, you, get, you, get your, you get your first tranche of funding, you're all gun ho you get out there, you get your first customer, uh, and then all of a sudden you gotta turn into a real business. Right. People fund your idea, but now they're gonna fund your business, and that chasm is a tough one to cross. And to be frank, a lot of companies don't make it over. But Ray very successfully took call copy over that chasm and is uh, really on a rocket ship now. So I'll ask you kind of how you did that piece of it. Sure, well, the answer to the problem is to have a good team. Um, we've got a great partnership uh, in the business. People that have uh, co-founded the company and have, have grown it since day one that were committed to each other. Um, I now realize, you know, after many years, how valuable uh, that was. You know, we took it for granted. We, we knew the, uh, we just needed to stick together and build it, but we didn't really realize what the value was in that. So the valley of death for us, and by the way, I've, I'm a, a developer by nature. I've got a coding background, right? So I'm, I'm not an MBA. I don't, I don't have a business degree or anything like that. Um, so I thought if we built it, they will come, right? So that happened kind of quick. We, we got a first customer, and it, it proved that model, right? This one, one customer proves a model. And uh, then we realized it doesn't and went without <laughs> sales uh, for about six or seven months after we'd already hired some people. And so uh, I would call that the valley of death. Uh, we, uh, we were still bootstrapping the company, and um, we'd chosen to, to go that route because, uh, honestly, at the time, funding was uh, even harder to get. There wasn't really um, a local funding group that um, understood the software industry um, and uh, how quickly we needed to enter the market, improve the model, and grow or fail. Uh, so we went out on our own, landed a deal, landed another deal, uh, funded the, the company for a little bit. But um, So that, that time period is really, really telling for us. And what it forced us to do is to think about the company from a different perspective. We were thinking about it in terms of product and features. We weren't really thinking about it in terms of value proposition to the customer. That's when we uh, started really looking at our competition. You know, we were pretty arrogant and cocky. We, we thought that we built a better product. And uh, just because of that, that's why people would build our software. And um, you know, a good friend said, you know, you can have a, an A product and a C sales team and you'll fail, but you'll have an A sales team and a C product and you can be successful. And we, that really changed our mentality and, and how we thought about things. So we looked at the market and we thought we were just trying to sell to call centers. Well, you know, that's, that's a, a pretty big industry. Uh, so we narrowed our focus and uh, really started defining who our, our customers were that we were targeting and figured out really the top three value propositions uh, uh, that we could serve better than our competition. Um, that really took us uh, to a new level. We realized that all of a sudden we became a fighter jet against a bunch of jumbo jets. Uh, our two main competitors are Israeli. Uh, they're both public. They're both 500, 600 million dollar a year companies. And these are the companies that we're beating. Um, and it's because that there's a niche um, that uh, that we needed to serve. Um, ended up kind of taking the Toyota approach, started small and incrementally started uh, building a brand around the company and building a team and, and have grown it successfully, I think, because of that. So uh, again, key to success is is your team, your your partners, and the, the employees that you, you hire. Thanks. Great, great enough. If I could jump in here with a, another question. Um, you guys have are, are on a great you know, some of you early on on a great trajectory, trajectory uh, Ray, of course, much further along. Um, if you think about this community and, you know, the people in this room, uh, what we have here in this community, what could we as a community be doing? What, what additional help do you need that could have helped you get to where you are, maybe even faster? I'll start with you, Ray, and you can uh, follow on to what you just said. All right, I understand this is being recorded. I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here a little bit. Um, my perspective goes back probably a little further. This was the days before Tech Columbus was formed when it was still just a, a couple of, of smaller entities um, and you know not as much uh, tech going on in Columbus. Um, I will say that uh, things have changed over the years, and where we are today is we've got not only uh, big industry helping, but we've also got a great uh, um, organic community uh, in, in the technology space of, of meetups and, and uh, people just meeting for fun and, and collaborating and working on new projects. There's startup weekends, there's 10X, there's 1492. None of these things existed. So when we entered the, um, you know, tried to enter the market, uh, really that all that was available uh, was SBA loans and 
uh, there was OTAF, but um, the process for that was long and it was expensive to do. So um, it didn't serve the software space that well. It served a lot of spaces, but not software. So I think Columbus is on the right path. I think there's, you know, compared to a lot of other cities, um, it, it's clear that there's some areas to grow, but uh, the momentum that we have, I think, has is, is, is been very noticeable outside of, of Ohio. Um, I, I travel a lot to the West Coast. I go to a lot of different, um, you know, software and related events and uh, Columbus is, is starting to come up. Um, now, a problem I see, um, it, you know, I'll, we'll do a lot with Ohio State and, and other local colleges trying to uh, get talent early, find people, and I usually find that the, the people that are, are smart uh, usually have already lined up uh, jobs at Cisco or Microsoft <coughs> or Google uh, in their sophomore year, um, you know, way, way before we can really get in, in front of them, and uh, this happens time and time again. So, um, you know, some initiatives around that, uh, another thought I, you know, realized on the way down here that I, I never come downtown. I, I couldn't find a place to park, and I, I've heard that's not a problem because of that, just coming downtown. But you know, I, I think we can bring more people to the center of the town, and I know there's a, the tech corridor initiatives and everything. But really, um, you know, those are some of the, just the, the outside perspectives. Um, again, though, uh, there, there are local, a lot of local collaboration groups that have formed in the last uh, couple of years that, um, that that I know a lot of us have been to that. I think is really changing the dynamic right now. And we're, we're taking advantage of them and, and, and giving back. That's great. Dave, yeah, follow um, up with that? Yeah, this is my first time at uh, the CMC, uh, but I understand there's a lot of lawyers, government officials, and lobbyists here. And, and you know, I'll speak for all entrepreneurs, including my growers on the field. Make it easier for us to get cash. Right. <laughs> it is so hard to get funding. Look at the level of talent that you have at this table here. Right. I was a management <laughs> consultant. This guy is like a some genius kid thing. Right, and Ray, <laughs> Young and dumb. Right, and, 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 Ray, and Ray's a known entity in the community, okay? So, you know, I mean, but I mean, imagine a, a grower who's, who has a great new technology of how to uh, increase the uh, sugar content, nutrient density of blueberries, and that could just blow the market out where you don't even need sugar to add jam anymore. I know one of these guys, right? How does that person get cash? All right. What's an accredited investor? Right. The, the level of hoops we have to jump through. What's an 83B when you're signing up to get funded? I mean, all the things that we have to do without the support of the lawyers and the, these guys here would have been impossible. And I can't even imagine for somebody who hasn't had the level of experience and training that we've had taking their, uh, a step into this. So uh, I know there's a crowdfunding uh, amendment or not amendment, some bill going across Obama's desk soon. Get behind this, understand what this is, because this is how we're going to get out of this mess. All right. But that'd be, I would find, our greatest challenge. Good. And I'll ask the whiz kid maybe to weigh in a little bit, who's, uh, who's spent most of the last year in one uh, support program or another. So, uh, I feel like I've been through a series of rehabs or something. <laughs> um, we, I think my team got in at a really good time. I think there's a lot of momentum here in Columbus. Um, we engaged Tech Columbus early, and by engaged, asked them questions, and they hit us between the eyes and said, no, you're not even close. But um, we went through um, Tech Columbus early on, and then the 10X Accelerator shortly thereafter. And um, had it not been for those two organizations, we would not be, I would not be sitting here. We would probably already be out of business. Um, I, I can wholeheartedly say that. Um, 10 Accelerator gave us some some very early funding, believed in our idea and the team, and just surrounded us with mentors, local entrepreneurs that have been there and done that. So that was, that was more of that is what I think the city needs, is people getting behind entrepreneurs and saying, you know, uh, we believe in you, we know you're gonna fall, but we're gonna be right there to pick you back up again when you do fall. So uh, more people that support local businesses, believe in entrepreneurs, uh, more accelerators like 1492, 10X, um, I think those are all good initiatives that w we just need to build on. You, you, know, you know, Derek, actually, and, and we were talking about this, with, Tim mentioned this before, I think there's this um, support us, but don't coddle us, <laughs> right? So I think one of the hardest things, at least I'll, I'll speak for myself, is getting candid feedback from people. Everyone, it seems, is, oh, nice job, good job, way to go. No, we, we need candid feedback, but we also need your support, so understand that this is a process of failure and, and overcoming these failures. So support us, but give us the feedback. We need it. Um, being nice is great, but it's sort of a, I don't know, it doesn't help. 
<laughs> yeah, that's good. Great, great point. Great point. That's a challenge that we have uh, in this community sometimes. So, thanks for those comments. Uh, I think we're getting close to Q and A time. So, if you have a question or start thinking about your questions, but let me throw one more, uh, Chris, at you. Uh, three great companies sitting up here. How do we get a lot more Azotis, Accepteds, and call copies? Well, that's a great question, and. Um, one of the reasons why I joined Tech Columbus a year ago is that you know, I've been very fortunate in my career to spend the last 25 years being part of some really innovative companies, CompuServe, Meditech, Pinnacle Data Systems, others. Um, Pinnacle's in the process of being acquired. Meditech doesn't exist really in its natural form anymore. And CompuServe is great in history books, but to be frank, other than the legacy of the people that it created, there's very little left of that business. And part of why I joined is that <clears throat> this community really needs to help build an overall entrepreneurial ecosystem that embraces and promotes these type of businesses. And really, there's a couple of phases around that. We need a, we need a program to encourage our young people, encourage um, everybody in the community to want to be an entrepreneur as a way of creating a career for themselves, not just as a last resort or not just looking at them as one of the crazies. <laughs> so, if you look at if you look at Dave and you look at Derek, you know, big part of what our job is to, is to find more of those and help. And I say our job, I mean as a, as an overall community, not just Tech Columbus, is to find those, encourage them coming out of college. Hey, your only choice is to go to get this job. Derek was an honors student, uh, on a full ride honors scholarship and a program, in, as well as his partner, and they walked out of it and said. You know, we're going to go do our own thing instead of going to work for a Fortune 500 company or something else. We need more people doing that because that's how it's going to create the jobs. Beyond that, though, if you look at the call copies of the world, there are many, many companies that have been able to start and get to the stage that, that Accepted is, get to the stage that Zodi is. Much fewer have gotten to the stage that Call Copy is. And there's a there's a, the, the valley of death needs to be bridged in many ways. It needs to be bridged through the community to help them with their first customer, to help them with their banking relationships, to help them with legal services, to help them with a support system where people would choose to buy from somebody in Columbus instead of choosing to buy from somebody someplace else. On the flip side, we also need help you know, in invested capital. As Ray mentioned, he just did a phenomenal job with this latest round um, of financing his company, um, but it was backed by a New Jersey venture capital firm. So on one hand, that's positive in the sense that a firm on the East Coast said, hey, here's an investable company in central, you know, central United States that we want to invest in. The downside is there wasn't anybody in Columbus that you know, could rise to the same occasion to put it in. We need to work through that. We need, to, we need to create an environment where we not only encourage um, people to start companies, but we need to continue to build out that ecosystem in Columbus to help develop and grow the mid-sized startups that, so they turn into real companies, they create those jobs, they create that revenue for the city and drive that going forward. And these are three examples of some really big thinking guys that um, have taken the plunge. If you know of other people like them, <laughs> Encourage them to do the same thing. If they need assistance and help, you know, there's lots of resources between Columbus 2020, Tech Columbus, uh, the university, et cetera, that can feed them and help them, uh, help them grow. And it, as uh, Rich comes up, if I could make one other comment, if, if this kind of stuff gets you jazzed, you want to be at the Innovation Awards on February 2nd. So a, a, a big plug here, February 2nd at the Convention Center, uh, the Tech Columbus Innovation Awards, 13 award categories, over 1,000 people. It's an incredible uh, night where you can really see innovation come to life. So hope you can be there for that as well. Thanks, guys. Um, we always leave room for uh, uh, questions from the audience as a community conversation organization. Uh, we also, though, I wanted to, wanted to uh, not forewarn, but tell you, at least inform you, that we uh, Televise, uh, we filmed this for tele, uh, tele, televised broadcasting on ONN, uh, streaming on CMC's website and the Columbus Metropolitan Library website. Uh, if you have a question, come up to the microphone, introduce yourself, 
ask your question, and we ask you in advance to uh, refrain from making long editorial comments. So, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Phil Sorrentino, Humor Consultants. Uh, first of all, let's invite you to join the Metropolitan Club as a reason to come downtown. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that that's what a lot of us use this club for. It's a reason for us to come downtown, and it's, it's benefit a lot of us. So we give you that invitation. Uh, as a businessman for my technology, I only need five things. Help me control my cost of goods. Help me control my expenses. Help me increase my revenue. Train me and support me. Now, most companies try to save money by not investing in training and support, which I think is absolutely crazy. What do you do for your customers to help them in the training and support uh, side of the business? Ray, you want to take that one first? It's probably your sure. For you. Sure, yeah. So um, our, our software is, is pretty large in terms of, of what it can do. So up front, uh, part of the deployment is actually professional services. There's three stages of it, uh, varying from administrative to uh, basic end user to uh, really the, the high end, how to use the software. Uh, we've also realized that um, with the background that we have in, in our specific industry within call centers is that uh, we have a unique perspective in that we get to see a bunch of companies and see what they're doing. Um, we've owned and operated call centers also. Um, now we own and operate uh, software providers to call centers. So a lot of people have asked us to, to help them. Um, local companies here have said, you know, I, I would rather be an insurance company than a, co than a call center company. You know, help me be, a, help me take care of the call center problem. Uh, you know, so we can manage risk, whatever it might be. So uh, those are things. Now, in terms of uh, kind of the the free side of, of things, uh, we offer up training to our customers on a regular basis. We do it efficiently through uh, through a webinar, through GoToMeeting or Citrix, whichever we happen to be using at the time. And uh, we invite all of our customers uh, to, to send anybody they want to for free uh, to these types of events. Um, we also have an online knowledge bases. We have an online community uh, within our, our website that's, that's pretty unique in the industry. Um, the, the industry analysts actually really love the fact that we're doing that, where we're, we invite customers to, to collaborate with each other and help each other and sharing, you know, how their, their, their best practices or, or how they're performing uh, performance evaluations, whatever they might be. Uh, lastly, uh, our first uh, customer users group will be this year. Uh, we've, uh, in, in a day and a half of sending a survey out to our customers, we had 90 people respond saying that they would enjoy traveling to Columbus, Columbus, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, uh, to be part of, uh, of a users group. So that'll be really neat to have a bunch of companies here and uh, it's going to be a, a couple of days of, of nothing but call center best practices and, and people learning from each other uh, about what, what, they're, what they're doing. George O'Donnell, trustee, CMC. Last month, uh, Michael Moritz was here and had an inspiring talk about venture capitalists. At that same meeting, uh, Alex Fisher uh, noted that there are 125,000 college students in central Ohio. And I'm wondering what Tech Columbus does to reach out to the uh, brightest of the classes. One question. Second question, what does uh, Tech Columbus do to engage sophomores and high school students to become involved in STEM classes and excelling. Thank so, you. Uh, let, me, let me just quickly comment that the, the, the short answer is a lot, but there's always more that we could be doing. And with 1492, this accelerator program that Chris has mentioned, we had a really, really unique engagement with uh, Columbus State and CCAD. You want to take a moment to talk about that? Yeah, so mentioned today was two accelerators. And ju so just real quickly, what an accelerator is, is a finite amount of time. It's a competitive process um, where teams compete to get into it. If you're a finalist for that or selected to be in part of the program, it's a 10 or 11 week accelerated program to move your business forward. We give you seed capital. Um, we give you mentorship, we get you exposure to investors and to potential customers, and we provide you a significant amount of education. There's two programs really running in town today. Tech Columbus runs one called 1492. Ohio State Fisher School of Business runs one called 10X. Uh, Dave was in 1492, Derek was in 10X. They're excellent ways for, for, you know, for new startup businesses to really get, to get launched. Um, we ran ours, as Tim mentioned, in cooperation this last time with uh, CCAD and Columbus State, which I think was great. We got a great pool of people. 
but not only just the participants, but we had interns from CCAD working with the companies, um, did an outstanding job, but also gave me exposure to real businesses, which frankly um, is harder for some of those students than it is maybe for a business student um, to get exposure to companies. So those things are great. Beyond those, I would say, you know, we work very closely with, um, with the Business Builders Club at Ohio State, with the New Path Group, which is, the, both of those are, uh, are entrepreneurial clubs within Ohio State, one in the engineering school or the CI information school, and the other one in the business school. Um, and we also work um, closely with, uh, uh, with the other colleges in the area through our outreach programs, whether it be Denison, Ohio Wesleyan, um, and others to try and help set up entrepreneurial programs with them. Lastly, we have a space actually inside of our incubator we call the Beta Box. Um, we've made uh, open invitations to students um, to be able to come in and work if they have a business idea. So they can come in free of charge, work in our building on projects, get aligned with other entrepreneurs that are in the same process and be able to kind of engage in those teams. Um, and all of those things we think help codify a community of, of entrepreneurship very early in the stages for these, uh, for these students. And you know, I'll make one final comment about your second point, George, which was uh, high school students. Uh, and, and we have a real challenge, I think, to, to deal with that issue in terms of getting uh, young people interested in science and technology careers. But I will, I will make another plug for the Innovation Awards because if any of you were last year at the Innovation Awards, we give out a high school uh, scholarship, two, two scholarships every year, two or three, three scholarships I think every year. And during the program, we interviewed the winners and I will tell you, they stole the show. They were the most creative, the most engaging. I mean, just fabulous, this great talent out there. We just need to, to spark it in our young people. So an important issue. You know, Tim, one thing, this is unscripted, by the way. Um, <laughs> one thing I would like to challenge everybody around entrepreneurialism is it's great to get students and the young people involved, um, but the bigger challenge is how do we take people who are 28 to 45, who have experience, been through a number of life cycles, understand how to talk to other adults from different uh, uh, areas of life, and get them to take the jump, right? How do we do that? So you're making a cushy job, you're making your $100,000 a year, and you have a great idea, but you got the two kids. You know, how do we get them? Because those are the ones who have a much higher probability of being successful, all right? I mean, 23-year-old, you're very rarely you're gonna see Mark Zuckerberg's out there. That doesn't happen, all right? So how do we do that? I don't have an answer, but it's a challenge. Rob Shepard, uh, CMC intern, uh, writing intern, and student at Ohio State. George actually hit on a lot of uh, the question that I wanted to ask, which was, um, what are you guys doing with Ohio State specifically to engage students? Um, I guess the other part of my question would be to Derek, uh, with the ability, with the view of hindsight, um, what would you have done during your college career, maybe um, extracurricular activities aside from um, the, entrepreneur, the entrepreneurship minor that is at Ohio State and some other things? Um, what would you have done? Um, and then uh, kind of addressing what David just said, would you recommend students to come right out and uh, take the plunge like you said instantly into companies like Tech, uh, Tech Columbus to become entrepreneurs or rather go in five, ten years of experience to uh, maybe have a little bit more uh, percentage of success um, afterwards. So, thanks. That's you, Derek. That's you. Uh, short answer, I think I would have tried to, to start a business earlier in college. What better place to take a risk um, and what better network do you have of um, people around you that you can tap into and build a great team? Uh, I waited, I took the entrepreneurship uh, major at University of Cincinnati, um, which, which gave me the academic knowledge I needed, but um, I think just diving in earlier, you know, Business Builders Club, as Chris mentioned, is a great resource mm -hmm. at Ohio State. I would have attended startup weekends. I wish I would have got more involved and just tried something sooner. You know, try early, fail early. You don't have much to lose. You're eating ramen noodles either way. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that, that's uh, that's good. I, I actually took a different uh, path uh, because early on I just wasn't as driven as Derek was. So I was an Ernst and Young consultant. I was more of a, an experienced junkie. So I wanted Ernst and Young allowed me to travel around the world. Uh, then I lived in Austin, Texas. I lived in D.C. Um, and it was exposed to all sorts of technologies. Uh, me and my friends, we were talking 
And I think that I've had almost $250,000 worth of training pushed into this brain because I went a different route. Um, now, the problem with that is, is when you get to 28, 29, 30, we're well, gonna start pumping out the kids, all right? And then your priorities shift. So there's this risk reward thing of when you wanna get into this. So I'm, 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 you know, I don't have children right now, so I can take this risk <laughs> and there's not a lot to lose. All right, Darren Hattinger with Tipping Point Renewable Energy here in Columbus. David, I can identify with that. I left a very good paying job at the worst time in the economy and I have two kids. So <laughs> <laughs> it's our business, so I can very much identify. I guess my question is, uh, a lot of the talk has been around uh, college kids and the focus in coming out. And even though I went, uh, I just hired four veterans yesterday who didn't necessarily go to college, but they have more real world experience than anyone I've met. I have about 50 more to interview over the next week or two for uh, solar installation that we're doing. How can we focus more of our jobs and not just reach out to the colleges and maybe train or get our training programs around to things that aren't just an impediment to people? Because I do teach too actually at Columbus State sometimes and I still don't like the way the training programs are set up because they're there for so many hours to get a certificate that doesn't get people out on the jobs we do, putting this stuff together and making it flourish. How can we better tackle, and there's a large workforce coming back that is very highly trained already. How can we tap into that and maybe kind of gear more towards around that? So I'll, I'll make one remark about that. Uh, back in October, uh, Tech Columbus put out a, a study, uh, an IT skills gap study to show uh, what the needs are in the marketplace for IT workers. So, we, you know, we, we talked to businesses, industry, and we asked them, you know, you, you, you obviously have jobs open, and there are people out on the streets. Why aren't you plugging them into those roles? Mm -hmm. And that, that being able to identify what the needs are mm -hmm. and then being able to train the workers to meet those needs, that's, the, that's a huge opportunity. So I think... You know, we, there are opportunities out there, but how do we match, make that match work? Um, other thoughts? I, I, think it's a tough, I think it's a tough answer. Um, the reality is in entrepreneurship is it takes risk. And if you're not willing to take the risk, it's very difficult. And that happens also if you want to be an employee of a startup company, you know, because it's lower pay, worse hours, worse benefits, higher risk. So who goes to work for those companies? It's either the unemployable <laughs> or <laughs> people that want to embrace the risk, and you hope it's the latter, mm -hmm. right? So part of the challenge is people have to shift their mindset. You know, there's also been a lot of studies to talk about um, how many new businesses are started by immigrants to the United States. It's a dramatic different percentage than it is of the populace as a whole and part of it is because they come with a lot less to lose and they also come from societal environments where people were majority of people were entrepreneurs the majority of the people sold things in marketplaces did whatever so they came with this entrepreneurial spirit I think I'd speak for all these guys I'd love to get senior level people into their companies that had a lot of knowledge base that were willing to come in at startup wages. You know what I mean? Live on ramen noodles and do whatever. Um, and that's the mindset of that I think a lot of people that want to um, get involved in these kind of technology companies move themselves forward. They also have to shift their mindset toward, you know, you're not getting 20 vacation days a year, you're not getting that kind of salary, and you're not going to like the benefits package. But the upside of being part of a really high growth, exciting, you know, potentially lucrative equity ownership type scenario, um, you know, is got to outweigh the, the comfort level, right? Ray, you going to add to that? Yeah, so I, I think I have another kind of unique perspective. I don't have a college degree. Uh, so I decided to enter the workforce and learn by uh, being around others. And I don't think that makes sense in every industry. Certainly, I, I wouldn't want a doctor that doesn't have a degree. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, in, in IT specifically, I think that that's accepted and, and somewhat the norm, right? Um, you, you hear about that more often than not in the news. 
And uh, the reason is, is because innovation happens so fast, technology happens so fast. So when I look at resumes of people that we want to hire, um, yeah, we look to see if they have a degree, but that just tells us they made a commitment right. to something for a period of time. Did they have a job and hold it for more than four years? That shows me they made a similar commitment. Uh, so we look at more achievements and successes. Uh, I want to know that if, if I have a programmer that they're up at night programming or they're reading books like Good to Great or Crossing the Chasm, you know, the people that aren't sitting around watching TV, people that are constantly trying to improve themselves and want to surround themselves with other types of people that want to improve themselves. So, uh, for instance, this last week I uh, went to an event up at uh, near Sandusky called Code Mash. Uh, if, it's a coding thing, probably nobody's heard of it, but basically the best of the best from all around the country go to Sandusky, Ohio to the water park. It's kind of gross. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but also at the same time, because you've got the heavy thinkers that are really making change in, in software and in IT uh, all together, and you just sit around talking, uh, learning from each other and, and trading information and, and trying to recruit each other. It's actually kind of neat to see. but. You know, our, so our approach has been a little bit different. Um, yeah, we've hired people with master's degrees and, and, and stuff, and that's great. You know, they're very smart people, but it was because they're doing all these other things as well. And so I think it's more than just your initial degree. It's the continuing education, and it's the fact that the person takes the initiative themselves to do it. We have time for one more question. Okay, great. Um, mine, oh, sorry, my name is Jordan Davis, and my question is more about the perception you've noticed about our culture and if you think it's changed, not changed, or how can we change. So um, I'm a recent graduate, and I have noticed that sometimes you we lack, and I don't know if this is just Columbus, but this risk and this idea that failure is okay. So you can try once, and if it doesn't work, try again. Don't just give up and go to what's easy. So I'm wondering if you've noticed that, if it's prevalent, and that's a hindrance to why people don't invest. Or um, So what has that caused? And if it's changing, or this generation's different, I'm just interested in your perception. Were you guys eager to yeah, jump I mean, on that? Th there's a generational divide. I'm not trying to start a generational warfare. It doesn't <laughs> help anything. We all would have made the same mistakes had I been in your shoes as a baby boomer. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, there is, there is a, a risk aversion I've noticed in Columbus, Ohio, in the Midwest, to investing in startup ventures uh, where the path isn't set. Failure uh, is part of the process. And um, you know, we're seeing it again, but thank God for the 1492 program, Tech Columbus. And there are pockets forming of entrepreneurial wealth and of people who will, who will give it a chance. So I would agree with your assessment that there is a, a divide. The young people are all over this, by the way. They, 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 they get it. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I'm, I'm kind of in between generations. I'm 31, so I, I kind of am right on the edge of both. And um, definitely there's a change in, in the workforce. So um, the older generation expects to, to stay at a job much longer. Uh, college age uh, generation or, or the people that are just out of college expect to bounce around quite a bit. Uh, saw a really good presentation. Um, the City of Columbus did the Attract and Retain initiative, and one of the takeaways of the research they did is they found that, that college students expected to dabble around and uh, try new things and figure out if it's what they like rather than, than making a long-term commitment to a company. So obviously that changes the dynamic of what you have to provide as an employer uh, to people to be able to, to keep them and, and attract and retain and, and, and grow relationships long-term. Um, we're seeing similar things too in, in the call center industry, so the way that people interact with each other. Uh, you know, we're doing a lot of phone-based call recording right now. That's because most of the people that are buying things use phones, but uh, year over year, there's more email, there's more text, there's more social media uh, getting you know, into the, the call center. So I think we're seeing similar results in industry because of, uh, of some of the social things that you're, you're talking about. I'll put in one last plug, which is, you know, the. The state of Ohio has the Ohio Third Frontier Fund, which is the envy of states throughout the United States. So hopefully you all voted for it twice, but at least in more than the majority <laughs> of you did. Um, and that's a you know, multi-billion dollar program that feeds funds into a lot of different ways, but the way that we most um, associate with it in Tech Columbus is it provides <coughs> the, um, the basis for a lot of our very early stage funds as well as a lot of our services. And so, so the question that was asked, the reality is, is that it's very difficult to get, um, in most cases, uh, institutions or individuals to make investments at very, very early stages because the risk is just so high. So the state, um, I think it's done a phenomenal job of standing up these funds to allow 
us to, to provide that er, very early stage investment um, in these companies and each, you know, each two or the three of these companies and to a certain degree call copy as well through the subsidization of the, uh, the subsidy on the incubator in which they were in um, has all um, gone to help that launch um, of those companies and, and that's a program that you know is, uh, is set to ne last for the next four years um, it's going to be very critical I think going forward for continuing to drive this entrepreneurial ecosystem and hopefully it's a program that will continue for many years to come. Well, thank you. We uh, continue the conversation out in the lobby with coffee and cookies. But before you go, one more plug for February 2nd. Sign up for the event. And thank our panel, uh, Ray Bohack, Derek Brown, David Ronaldo, and Chris Winslow, and particularly Tim Haynes, our moderator. Thank you, guys. Sign up for next week and we can hear about casinos and questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great job. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely.